and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment for th through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple. Com coming to us straight from Autark LLC, the ma the man responsible for one of the few OSR games that I actively simp for, and res and more importantly responsible for the superhero smorgasbord known as Ascendant, which is now coming back with its newest Kickstarter for both a Platinum Edition and for a Rogues Gallery, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one and only Alexander Macris. How you doing today, man? Hey, I'm really good. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for com thanks for coming on and dealing with time zone hell and in my case, um, old man winter not knowing when to fucking leave. Ha. Yeah. Where where are you based? I'm still in Minnesota. Oh man, yeah, it's cold up there. My well, my family not... lives in my family lives in Minnesota too. It's not that cold. It's only twenty five degrees. That's warm. No, that's that's cold. <laughs> it's it was seventy here today. I wore a hoodie. <laughs> I don't mean I don't mean to rub salt in the wound or anything like that, but se seventy saying. is hoodie weather. It was a little chilly. I think you know exactly why I'm laughing at you for that. I know exactly why you're laughing. So let's move on. Yeah. So, as I now, as I understand it, Platinum Edition is more of a director's cut or a revised edition of Ascendant, not a full-on second edition. No, it's not at all a second edition. The game has only been out about a year. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was that when I did the first rulebook, uh, I sold out of the entire print run. I, I'd never had that happen before um, so quickly, but. Every single thing I print, because I printed twice as many as I needed um, for the Kickstarter. But after I did the Kickstarter, more people ordered, so I had to do a second printing. And since I had to do a second printing, and there had been some errata in the first printing, I made sure to update all of the errata. And so that becomes the Platinum Edition. Yeah. So it's simply the, it's simply the core rules with all of the errata updated. Mm -hmm. Everyone who purchased the Ascendant Core Rules and got the PDF has already gotten the updated PDF. So there's not it's it's not um, it's not the expectation that hey you already bought the core book and now you need to buy the core book again you totally don't have to do that at my own gaming table five of the six players are just using the core book you know the the uh, with the uh, with the three page printout of uh, errata if you need it mm -hmm. um, so for people that already have ascendant it's about rogues gallery but I wanted to make sure that for people who didn't have ascendant they had an opportunity to buy the core book. Yeah, that that answers one question that I was that I was going to have, and that and that is the stuff that's in Platinum Edition. For those who've already bought Ascendant uh, on uh, or be, or back the original, they're not gonna, they're not going to be left behind. No, not at all, not at all. They've already, as I said, they've already gotten the Platinum Edition PDF. And is is it just is it just um unifying the errata that that had developed? Or Correct. were there some significant changes between nope. OG and nope. Platinum? Nope. No, no significant changes at all. It's it's just a second printing that has all of the uh, errata. It's the same way that uh, I was inspired by the video by video game industry, where you know you look at Skyrim and it's the same game, but they have Skyrim, Skyrim, you know, collector's edition, Skyrim, Xbox Live edition, you know, but it's all the same game, but they just give it a new a new name to help with people understand, like, hey, we're doing a re-release of this. That's all. Yeah. Ad admittedly, some yeah. versions of Skyrim are, have, uh, have, is have issues with mod, have issues with modding, which, that's a whole, they, that's and, a whole Right, and then they fix some bugs. Yeah, exactly. Basically, yeah. basically think of it as like, here was the first edition, and now here's the, uh, Here's the 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 second version that has the bugs fixed. Yeah, although although um, I can always I can always make fun of Bethesda games and bugs as as an evergreen joke because because they're never gonna get fixed. Yeah. Uh, look, all critics have their whipping boys, and my and mine is as I as I've called him the mop. 
Even though ah! he... Yeah. That's what he, he that's what he looks like. He looks like a mop. He does. He but... does. Now with the, now taking that into taking that into account, what were what were some of the things that in hindsight with the original ascendant and ascendant that you felt either create either created pro either created problems you didn't account for or were just things that you wanted to fix and had and weren't able to do so until you um, started putting in errata. Oh, so the errata for the most part um, was just that it was there was nothing functionally broken in the game. It was simply that over the course of uh, the development cycle. Sometimes I made changes in one area and then they weren't necessarily reflected in another area of the book where they should have been. And so you would have like, let's say a, a conflicting uh, definition of a particular condition, um, things like that. And so the errata was to make sure all of that got corrected. Um, there were some other minor points, like in certain cases, exponents got printed as normal numerals which then made it impossible to understand the formula that I was trying to explain in the rule book. Mm. Um, the only really big change uh, was to duplication where I had gotten the math wrong. And so the duplication power um, got updated. Yeah. Now in uh, Rogue's Gallery, I do have a bunch of stuff that I've, that I've kind of said, hey, look, you know, here's some ideas for, you know, things you could use optionally to change the game if you want. Um, so for instance, I offer some suggestions in Rogue's Gallery on a new ramming power limit. Um, I offer some suggestions on probability control, some suggestions on collisions and rams between different size targets. Um, I have a bunch of new rules for fighting and moving uh, and spotting underwater, which weren't in the original rules. Um, I have rules for spotting and listing across really large areas. So the, uh, the basically the the core rules now are updated and essentially error free, and then Rogue's Gallery expands from there. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting that you br that you bring up fighting because when it, because um I do recall I do recall making some remarks at one point that that was something I, f I felt could have. Could have used a bit. Could have used a bit of expansion to account for more um, street level type of type of type of characters, which admittedly street level heroes is is a problem that a lot of supers games ha have. So I'm not going to fault you for that. Huh. I'm I'm not sure what you um what you would have wanted to see. I thought I did a pretty good job of of giving a bunch of templates for street level villains and. All of the various firearms and vehicles, but I think what uh, I think what I mean is for, is as far as the options that that character points are, are spent on, uh -huh. um, having having that having um I'm not I'm not saying have mo I'm not saying have more of everything, but um some t but it is e it is easy to get lost in the weeds of powers, I guess is the best yeah. way for me to put it. Right, right. Yeah, I can I can understand that. Um, well, you know, when you're designing a game that's already at 500 pages, you end up having to pick where you want to focus. And I felt like the sweet spot for gameplay is somewhere between the power level of the Teen Titans and the power level of the Justice League or X-Men to Avengers. So like that range, so... which is roughly power level 20 to power level 30. And I so... think that's where the... So that's, that's where I designed the game around. So city scale to national scale. Yeah, that's right. City scale to, to national superhero team. That's mm -hmm. correct. So the most powerful heroes in the Ascendant universe are national level superheroes like American Eagle. Mm -hmm. And then you've got city level heroes like Shadow Mancern, right? Yeah. So roughly power level 20 to power level 30. Now you can go above power level 30. And we've had a few you know, more cosmic level heroes in some of the games I've run. Um, and you, you know, there's a bunch of folks that I know of that are running um, at under power level 20, where they're doing pretty gritty campaigns. One guy um, did a fantasy campaign, and other guys using it to do some cyberpunk type stuff, um, which is great. And that, you know, the the beauty of the logarithmic math is it's scale free and it really works at every level. But um, 
but the the certainly the design intent is your roughly power level 20 to power level 30. Mm -hmm. Now with with that in, with that in mind one of the thing one of the things I was I was a bit curious about is in re is um in regard to the let's let's shift a bit into the creation of the rogues of the rogues gallery um cuz admit admittedly that was one of the things I do I do recall men mentioning that it need that it needed a bit more it needed a bit more in terms of I guess in I guess in terms of I guess in terms of of advers of adversary or ju or just or just modularity, which I know I know the latter is being um is being handled. You've I think you mentioned that the last time we talked, um, but with the with the rogues ga with the rogues gallery, would it be <laughs> fair of me to, th to say that? While the, while there's going to be a lot of it, there's going to be a lot of material when it comes to various villains within the Ascendant universe, but also also material for both players and GMs within the book. Yeah, so um, Rogues Gallery is definitely aimed at game masters. Uh, what it includes is about um, two and a half dozen new uh, characters. Mm -hmm. primarily intended to be antagonists for the adventurers. And then for each character, um, there's uh, artwork, there's a dossier written from the point of view of like a CIA intelligence briefing about the character's powers um, and what is known and what their secret identity might be and what their origin might be. But it's all written, um, you know, kind of diegetically in the world so that the GM can just print them and give them to the players. Um, and then it provides the game mechanical stats for the character, uh, explains the, you know, their true backstory. Um, and, uh, and then each one terminates with a story hook uh, that you can use to run a session of Ascendant. And, um, and all of the story hooks I've used in my own campaign. So, you know, I know they're viable uh, adventure seeds. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely makes the game a lot easier to just pick up and play. Yeah. You've got a host of villains you can use um, the groups that are covered, so there's Dark Emerald, which is a private military corporation that uses super soldiers. There's Exodus, which is an ascendant supremacist terrorist organization. There is the Soaring Sabres, which is China's national superhero team. And there is Spetsikatron, which is Russia's national superhero team. And then there's a bunch of independent villains as well. Um, so the uh you know so for example one of the one of the story seeds is that uh one of the members of the soaring sabers tries to defect to the united states and the other team members try to stop it and you're playing the u.s national team what do you do mm -hmm. so it's things like that um and then at the end of the book there's a, a section on expanded rules expanded powers things like that and that might be of interest to players um and then there's also an FAQ that raises some common questions that come up about the game. And again, that might be interesting to players. But it's primarily a GM source book. It's like a monster manual. Yeah. Now, a, a something that something that I've that I've seen that it, that is a bad habit that that some designers can fall into is give is giving giving these stats for for various for various monsters or their equivalent. Without giving a whole lot of advice on the on the best ways to you to use it, or just giving suggestions on how to effectively use that particular uh, monster, for lack of a better term. When it right. comes to when it comes to the NPCs that you ha that you have, whether it be the organizations or just or just um st just standard NPCs, um, do you have a sides on how on how to use how to use them? I know you gave that story seed example earlier, but is that a common thing that's going to be seen throughout the book? Uh, yeah. So um, each character has some design notes that um, explain a little bit how they were built and how their powers work and how you're supposed to play them. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then there's also se several hero archetypes in the book. Um, so the blaster, the bulldozer, champion, dark detective, gladiator, psychic, and speedster. Mm -hmm. and those are power level 20 pre-generated characters that you can just print out and play with. Um, so, hey, you want to do a pickup game of Ascendant? We've got six players. Here's six pre-generated power level 20 characters. Let's go. Yeah. And each of those actually has um, a how to play section that explains the tactics. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, the champion is a versatile build with all round effectiveness. He's strong enough to lift a 12 ton truck, fast enough to outfly a jet fighter, and tough enough to survive a hit from a tank gun. Mm -hmm. Here's what you need to do. You know, number one, adapt to the enemy, and then blah, blah, blah. You know, number yep. two, power stunt with your blast. Number three, protect your friends. By the way, for each of the templates, it gives you like that. So I think someone who reads that would definitely get a much better sense of how to play Ascendant, you know. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, when it, when it comes to the archetypes, um, just based on what you told me, I do appreciate that the, that the issue of what I like to call swim, damn it, isn't as, isn't as much of a, of a factor. Um, of, of, of what? Swim, damn it. Um. Basic. It's basically another form of what of what I've of what I've called hand of what I've called hand breaking and what TV tropes call this guy. Damn it, where it's the it's the polar opposite of it's the polar opposite of hand holding. And when dealing with supers games, even ones that provide um provide pre gen archetypes. Sometimes there's very there's very little advice on how to effectively utilize them. Instead, just giving mm -hmm. you the stats and it's, and assuming you you know how to do that. But much like how Stanley said, every comic is someone's first. I think the same thing can apply to role playing games. Yeah. But I'd like to go. I'd like to go into the the pre the um, archetypes that you br that you brought up of those seven, and just get a feel yeah. for what their what um. What more popular heroes might might be um might be rough equivalent to that to those concepts? Um, starting sure. with the blaster. Sure. Okay. So the blaster is presented as an attractive and popular NASA astronaut who gained cosmic powers um, after she had a paranormal experience on a safe flight on a space flight, mm -hmm. and so she's um, capable of flying at Mach four. She can deliver cosmic blasts that hit as hard as a tank gun. And then she's got telescopic vision to patrol the skies from 40,000 feet and spot evildoers from on high. Mm -hmm. So she is probably very close to how we might think of Johnny Flame from the Fantastic Four mm -hmm. uh, or any of the other series of flying blasters that are popular in comics. Mm -hmm. um, she hits really hard. Uh, she's a little bit of a glass cannon. She has to stay mobile um, so that she, you know, to avoid uh, getting caught up in melee with someone who can beat her up. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, and then the the bulldozer. So the you know the and I should add each of the characters actually comes with options to customize it. Um, you know, so change cosmic blast to annihilating blast to call on the dark powers of entropy. Change cosmic blast to rapid fire thermal blast to set targets aflame, mm -hmm. etc. So uh, so there's uh, five or six bullet points of customization options. Um, the bulldozer is a construction worker who took a hit from a bulldozer and halted it in his tracks when he ascended. And um, so he's built like a giant. He can carry 200 tons. He can throw an SUV across a 100-yard football field, shrug off a direct hit from a Tomahawk missile. Uh, so the bulldozer is obviously inspired by characters like Hulk and The Thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he has jump rather than flight. He rams people. He can protect more fragile friends um, and uh, he can regenerate quickly from damage. Um, Champion is was an electrician working in a nuclear power plant, sacrificed life to save co-workers, absorbed dose of, dose of lethal radiation, but instead of dying, he ascended. And he's a Superman XP, mm -hmm. so he patrols the skies. Um, you know, he has a uh, flight speed that's not quite as fast as the blaster. He has strength that's not quite as strong as the bulldozer. Um, he's got, uh, he's got uh, short range thermal blast, which is like his heat vision. So he's essentially a hybrid of the flying blaster and the strong man archetype. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, after that, we do the dark detective who's obviously inspired by Batman and Nightwing. He's a wealthy tech genius who 
fights crime in the shadows using high-tech gadgets and um he has a bunch of minions so he has like uh, uh a hacker a beat cop and a coroner that are his minions he can call on during play um he has contact with the police commissioner and then he has a bunch of gadgets he has a utility suit um that lets him you know crawl on walls do biochemical analysis um you know swing around the city etc mm-hmm uh, after that, we got Gladiator, who's like a regenerating street fighter with a sharp temper, edgy fighting style, prone to berserker rages. Um, you know, and he gets back up if he gets knocked down thanks to healing power. So he's, you know, he's obviously inspired by Wolverine and similar characters like Lady Shiva uh, or the Jade Warriors or you know any of your any of your melee scrappers that aren't so much invulnerable as they are hard to hit and quick to heal. Mm-hmm. Um. And there's the psychic, and so the, the psychic backstory I give is that while he was tripping on LSD to celebrate the 60s, the aging hippie turned psychiatrist un- accidentally unlocked his own psionic powers. So he can sense emotions, he can read minds, he can remotely view people in places, telepathically communicate, and then he can also deliver brutal mind blasts to overwhelm folks. So um, he's, you know, your Jean Grey or your Professor X archetype. Mm-hmm. Um and I even have as an option, you know, you can add the paraplegic drawback uh, to get some other powers, for instance, if you want to be more spot on to the Professor X template. Mm-hmm. Uh, the speedster was a bond trader living life in the fast lane and uh, until he started moving in the fast lane himself. Um, and, you know, he has uh, very, very, very high speed. He can do, um, you know, like a super concussive strike. Um impossible to surprise um and you know the the flash is the stereotypical speedster but also marbles quicksilver so those are the uh those are the seven templates and then we are going to have some stretch goals that will unlock some others um the scientist just got unlocked who's an inventor uh that can create gadgets in gameplay and then after the scientist will come the summoner um who has uh minions that yep. they can summon to like spirit minions or demons or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, I think we're pretty likely to get to that second stretch goal. We've already got to the first one, and um, and that'll give eight characters with a really and then eight characters each with um, five different customization options. So, uh, it I think it really broadly covers most of your comic archetypes at that point. Yeah. Now, the Kickstarter also mentions. Um, having in-character dossiers, yeah, and I'm guessing those are written in in a in-universe style. Yes. Uh, so I'm get so it, pro- it would probably be a case of of re- of in reading it you'd you'd get the ge- you'd get the gist of what um, in this case Squadron Intelligence knows. Um, since it since it's a dossier, I'm pretty sure there's some from an intelligence organization, there's probably some parts that are redacted. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. So I'll give you an example. So Rootkit has a really hilarious briefing because Rootkit is a technology controller. Mm-hmm. And so um, that briefing is actually done, is actually laid out as if it's typewritten rather than printed on a computer because they didn't want to talk about him on a computer because he's a technology controller. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the briefing, the subject Rootkit was captured on 11 November 2018 by Squadron Assets and transported... Constitution Island facility by warp. Subject presents as a young adult male, morbidly obese with diabetic neuropathy in both legs. Agent 1, names redacted under 402B7, uh, was assigned preliminary intake interview. After interview, Agent 1 reported the following findings on rootkit. Real name, Sam Hyde, born <laughs> September 1, 1993 on a Kiwi fruit farm near Auckland, New Zealand. Immigrated to U.S., graduated Drexel University in 2017. Claimed to have ascended after being harassed online by five guys. Expressed gratitude for release from mind control by maximum leader. Pledged full cooperation to help us in stopping that evil genius quote. 38 hours after interview, Agent 1 was arrested by FBI for possession of child pornography. Subsequent investigations found that Agent 1's smartphone had not shut down properly prior to entry into interrogation room. And Rootkit had psychokinetically accessed and manipulated digital assets on phone during course of interview. Despite reinstatement, Agent 1 refused further engagement with subject. New protocols were put in place for future interrogation efforts. It goes on from there. 
but they're all they're all written in character and they it's, um it's so it sounds halfway but first off i i had to i had to step away from my mic so i didn't bust out laughing <laughs> yeah uh, second um well i'll read you the next paragraph because it gets funnier he says Following up on intake notes, newly assigned Agent 2 was able to confirm valid birth certificate for Samuel Hyde, as well as transcripts of graduation from Drexel University Online. However, Department Intern 3 suggested subject had digitally created false records. Sam Hyde is apparently an internet comedian. Kiwi Farms is a digital hangout for trolls. And September 1, 1993, his alleged birth date is when AOL users gained access to Usenet. Intern 3 suggested squadron add knowyourmeme.com to Intel intranet. <laughs> um, I can't help but get flashbacks to some of to some of the reports written in written on um, SCP with the way oh, that's yes, structured totally. and totally. I'm guessing that Absolutely was an influence inspirational for how I thought about things. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. especially especially with the especially with the addendums. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, and I'm guessing because of the, because of the fact that they can be that they can be printed or co or copied out, um, they're present they're not presented in the usual page format. So they are presented as if they're um, dossiers, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the one of the add-ons you can add is um, to get the dossiers uh, separately printed in a cool Manila folder so that you can hand them out to your players. Yeah, I, fi I figured you were going to be doing a, that kind of um, add-on. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in with that in mind, one of one one other um, one other bullet point that I that I couldn't help but notice was the was um, the battlefield control, which I'm guessing is a power that's meant to lean into the master strategist kind of archetype. Which one? Uh, battlefield control. Oh yeah, so battlefield control is a new power um, that's in the rogues gallery, and it is uh, the power set uh, used by a character called Strategist, who is a sort of like Sun Tzu Chinese super genius um, and master of warfare. And um, what battlefield control lets you do, for instance, is you can make any two points on the battlefield adjacent to each other. Uh, so, you know, your troops need to overrun a trench line while well, you just put their current location and, and the bunker adjacent to each other and they just bypass the trench line entirely um, and, and things like that. So it's a it's a really neat it's a really neat power set. Mm -hmm. And I, I can I can cer I can certainly see it because I've and it'll it'll certainly make my job easy with with certain um, characters. But. So, and of course, of course, I couldn't help but notice that in several of the updates, you've given, you've given some, you've given some of the brief, some of the brief skinnies on several of the characters, including, I think, most of the soaring sabers, in the last few updates. Yeah, the soaring sabers have been presented as the sneak preview so far. So I just did all uh, yesterday. I did the sixth team member of yeah. the soaring sabers. That's right. Um. Uh, what what can you tell me about what can you tell me about Exodus? Right. Well, Exodus is the major villain of the series, um, and the biggest threat. Mm -hmm. uh, it was founded by um, a fellow called Maximilian Danixjold, who was actually part of the U.S. Uh, Project Ascension program and was their star pupil who was the most powerful ascendant that they had ever encountered. But um, Maximilian decided that he didn't feel that ascendants should be working for humans. They should be ruling humans. And so he used his position within the organization to recruit all of the rest of the most powerful ascendants to his position and then arranged for a massive massacre breakout um, from the Guantanamo Bay facility where they were based. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the people that breaks out is Manticore, and that kind of is the story of the first issue of um, the Star Spangled Squadron graphic novel. Mm -hmm. uh, Maximilian Danix Jolt himself 
um, escapes, creates Exodus as his organization is named because he wants Ascendants to exit their humanity. And he ends up conquering an island called Nehru in the Pacific Ocean. It's the smallest island nation in the world. So he conquers and he conquers the island of Nehru, um, sets himself up as a sovereign power there. And what Exodus does is it goes around the world and commits acts of terror and violence because people that are under high stress in the right conditions can become ascendants, mm -hmm. and they're trying to create more ascendants. So they're... Uh, so they're a highly destructive group, but they're not a nihilistic group. They're a socially Darwinian group. They believe, you know, uh, that which does not kill you will make you stronger. And if it did kill you, you were weak and never worthy of ascension in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they'll, you know, they'll blow up a jetliner hoping that one of the people will manifest the ability to fly, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um you know, beyond that, there's more there's more involved in their storyline, but you know, some of that stuff I'm gonna be telling in the course of future graphic novels, so I haven't you know, I haven't revealed it all, but I've got like a five year timeline worked out for the universe. Mm hmm And I think one one of the one tricky thing that can happen when you have a when you have a detailed setting is making sure that there's spot that there's um story seeds for a, for a table's party to be able to in, to be able to um put themselves into that world, I'm, right. gu I'm guessing right. you I'm guessing you're I'm guessing you have that in some form. Obviously, with the dossiers and the like, but there's for, there's forms of that there's forms of that within the Rose Gallery book as a whole. Yeah, well, the setting as a whole. So when the game begins, that is, if you're like if you're using the official Ascendant universe. The United States has established a super team called the Star Spangled Squadron, but the Star Spangled Squadron has had a absolutely brutal battle in Washington, D.C. that's left um, about half of the members disabled or dead. Uh, American Eagle has left the planet on some secret mission, and uh, the U.S. is essentially undefended by superheroes momentarily. So the idea is, if you're playing at a high power level, you can come in as the second generation of Star Spangled Squadron heroes. Mm -hmm. So you're the U.S. national team. And if you're playing at a lower power level, then you could be a city-based hero who's defending the city from, you know, Exodus terrorists, El Cartel drug lords, and all the other various minor threats uh, that exist in the world. Um, but yeah, the, the setting begins with what I would consider like a power vacuum that creates an opportunity for the player characters to get involved. Mm-hmm. Because what I what I didn't want was to have you know here's the Star Spangled Squadron and they're really cool and you'll never be that cool so don't bother playing right. In other words, White problem. Wolf. You didn't want White Wolf syndrome. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I loved a lot of White Wolf games, but they but they had a they had a bad habit of 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 over focusing on certain um, named characters. Yes. So, yes, they did. It was, and it it got increasingly irksome over time. I suppose I suppose one of the biggest offend, one of the real big offenders, even though I like the game to an extent, is um, Scion. I I don't think I'm familiar with Scion. Scion was one of was was a project that they did in the. T um, early to mid two thousands, it was split into three books: hero, demigod, and god. Um, uh -huh. The idea, the idea is the player is the player characters are um, ha are half divine. You know, uh -huh. taking the whole the whole thing of how in so much Greek myth you have someone who's a descendant of Ze of Zeus or one of the other gods, but mostly Zeus because he can't keep it in his damn pants. <laughs> and yep. ju and just going further with that idea. We using multiple Greek multiple Greek gods, Jap Japanese gods, um, Aztec gods, who are all assholes, and um, also also some deities from vo from voodoo. Though I will admit that's my weakest subject of the of the group presented, and of and of course Norse, and there were a few others that were that were added as it developed, but. Each of the pantheons was represented by one mascot character, like Don, 
Um, Donnie Rhodes was, who's who's on the cover of the first book, um, is a descendant of Thor. Ah, uh, okay. And as the books go from hero to demigod to god, there's this feeling like it, like you're seeing their expanded story until they eventually become gods themselves. Right. Which is nice and which is nice and all, but it but um. It can board. It can border on you see, on you seeing the on you seeing the character as if you're reading their story in a in a comic or in, or in a short or in a or in a short novel because well this is White Wolf. So it's a good it's a good move that you put in that kind of power vacuum so that you, yeah, so that you don't important. avoid that yeah. so you don't have that problem. Um. And as I know, it says I know it says that it's going to be 176 pages. I'm guessing that ev even even with the stretch goals taken into account, it's not going to hit higher than 200. Uh, no, no, even with stretch goals, yeah. All right, I I can I can certainly get that. Um, now for for the remainder, when it comes to ascendant. I'd like mm -hmm. to run a little bit of ex an experiment, and I told you about I told you about this before we went live. Yeah. Um, now there's a set of there's a set of characters that we originally cre that we here in the temple originally created for the UA Great Lakes project, but because of how they're designed, um, I feel that they can fit into just about any supers game, and even some even some sure. non supers games, depending on what what it is. And I'd like to go through. I'd like to go through them and how you might adapt them into um, Ascendant. Okay, let's do it. All right. So the first one is, uh, and I'm go and hang hang on. I get. I gotta make sure I got got Discord right. First one I'm sending is Aldrich Philby, A.K.A. Vibrato. That's the first image for you. So okay. His whole thing is vibrato is a perfect shapeshifter, as long as he doesn't have to, as long as he doesn't try and go bigger. Um, he has been, sh he I say he, but it, but Aldrich's actual gender is un is unknown, because Aldrich mm -hmm. has been shapeshifting since he was a since he was a little kid, right? So, to the to the point where he he doesn't even remember what it says male on his birth certificate, but. Whether that's actually the case is unknown, and if you ask him, he couldn't. He couldn't tell you. The reason he's the only one of the group that has a mask because he's legally required to wear that mask. Why is that? Because, because in order for, in order to in order to have something recognizable. Oh, I see. Because well, doesn't I, that defeat the point of being able to shape change if you still have to have the mask on top of it? It's to, that's the the mask is used on his on his official ID. Oh, I see. Okay, interesting. Um, well, that's a. I mean, in Ascendant, we would call that the replication power, which enables the character to transform into a virtually perfect replica of any target of the same species as himself. Mm -hmm. If he can also change into animal forms, then he would also have the skin changing power. All right. Yeah, and we have extensive rules for that. So that would be a very easy character to build, I think, yeah. in Ascendant. The idea with Aldrich was to take was to take the shape take the shapeshifter concept and kind of turn it on its head. Um, mm -hmm. The reason for the outfit is he's a bit of a theater brat, <laughs> and theater brats are are ver very dramatic and also very easy targets for me to pick on. Mm -hmm. Speaking from experience. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um. Everybody's had that one story of 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 having the corpse on stage while everyone is trying to make you crack. Yes. But second is Amelia Curtis, aka Sonic Bloom. Okay. Uh, her whole th her whole thing is is utilizing bursts of air to prop to propel herself. Okay. The downside is she's not very good at the whole breaks part of it. Got it. 
So, so does she? So she is a super jumper who sort of lands badly. Um, jump jumper. She basically uses those bursts of air to make to propel herself like a can, like a cannonball. Right, right. Okay, so that's an interesting character. Um, certainly, you could model it with ascendant. Uh, it, you'd basically model it, I think, as a limited use telekinesis where she can throw herself. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then there's rules for you know when you are thrown or fallen, um, and then you come to kind of a harsh landing, how much damage you take. And yeah. so, um, depending on her stats, you know, she probably in most circumstances would be okay. She might end up knocked prone in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and her primary method of attack, I imagine, is probably ramming people. Yeah, ram ramming people, which is the reason for the reason for the giant hands. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next is Carol Engel, a.k.a. Cordyceps. Who, the whole thing with her is that she, all throughout her skin, there's these little there's these little holds where seeds can be planted. Any seed that's planted, she can control the growth and develop and development of it. Mm -hmm. Any seed that's planted in her body, yeah, mean? or any seed that she takes from her body and plants into the ground. Um. She she has to plant she has to plant seeds into her skin and th and those ones she can make grow extremely rapidly and control ha and control what they grow into. Gotcha. Um, so it seems to me that that's probably a version of plant control, and then she uses plant control power stunts to mm -hmm. achieve other effects. Like for instance, in Ascendant, let's say you had plant control, and you said, you know, I want to have the plants. Um, I want to genetically modify them so that they are um, releasing poisonous vapors to create uh, a toxic fog. And you could do that. It would be two hero points. Um, that sounds like how I would handle that character. She sounds like a plant controller to me. Yeah, she she very much is. It's just there's no poison ivy style making plants come out of everywhere kind of thing. Uh huh. So you would do so you do plant control, but then you'd uh, you'd apply a power flaw to it that she can only control, you know, the the, the plants that she's carrying on her body rather than you know all plants. Mm -hmm. But it would make the power cheaper. Yeah, probably probably a material requirement because obviously she needs seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, next is Finn Heiko, aka Foxfire, who could be considered the prankster of this particular group. And again, given his power set, it's kind of natural. Um, he, anything that a Kitsune could do, he can do. Okay. So, a fair, a fair bit of, a fair bit of um, flame control, though his flames are always blue, and a lot of um, illusions. Mm -hmm. The catch is that in 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 order for him to activate the illusion. Um, he has to. He has to see who he, he has to see who he's messing with. Okay, sure. So that would be eye contact, illusion, and fire control. Mm -hmm. That would be super easy to model on ascendant. Yeah. Uh, next is Irvine Thales, aka Hadron. Um, his whole his whole thing is creating spheres that act as gra that act as um, localized gravity wells. He can either make it, he can either increase the gravity or reverse it or um or use it to change where down is. Mhm. Mm so, uh, ascendant has a power called gravity control that literally does exactly those things. Mm -hmm. So, you can, you know, cause people to be heavier, you can fling them up in any in different directions by reversing gravity or changing gravity. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, absolutely. And then it looks like he uses his gravity control. It looks like he has some sort of a wand or a, a, a mace. Uh, and it's, so that would be it's, it. Yeah, it's meant to be. It's meant to be a wand. It the uh -huh. that's that's meant to be a focus. focus of, yeah. So in ascendant terms, it would be what's called a device. And mm -hmm. so you would he would use deprived of his device, he might have lower um, lower supermetric points in the power. The uh, the idea with the idea with the focus is that if he doesn't have it, 
whenever you try and use that power, these spheres would show up in random places. So ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So I'm not sure how you'd work that into into a power flaw. Yeah, that would require a little bit of uh, of custom character creation um, because you're wanting to have uh, kind of a random scatter effect. And you know, there's rules for scatter in the game. Mm -hmm. Um, but there isn't a rule for saying if you don't have your device that your power causes scatter. So I think a good GM could probably sort it out, but that, that one in particular wouldn't be covered rules as written. Yeah. Uh, next is Cal Bridger, a.k.a. Jet Falcon. Um, one, might, one might think that, it's, that, it's that his abilities relate to flight. It, it's more that he... Um, if there's anybody I, I could use as an analog for him, I'd say, I'd say Forge in the sense that he's able to understand and and he's able to understand and and mess with tech and mess with any form of technology as long as he understands how it works. Uh huh. And when you say understand and mess with, like, what do you mean? Is he a, is he like a telepathic super hacker? Um, he is he is an engineer on steroids. <laughs> this is the best way for me to put it. Uh, so he makes inventions. Yeah, he he could he could make he could make he could make just as long as he understands the mechanics, he could make just about any kind of invent any kind of invention. Got it. Got it. And then is what he's wearing some of the things he's invented for himself? The this is a, what what you ha what he has on in the image is essentially a modular. Um, harness that he built that's meant to take different configurations because I I happen to like um, season two of the Iron Man cartoon and that was somewhat of an influence the idea is he has different configurations that that can be hot, that can be hot swapped in and out for different right. circumstances this is just the flight module right. got it so Jet Falcon you would build um, you you know you'd give him um, moderate uh, moderate characteristic scores, and then you would invest a bunch of points into the invention power, mm -hmm. which would let him dynamically create new inventions during the game. And then you would invest a bunch of points into the singular invention perk, and then you would use those points in the singular invention perk to create his um, multi-platform you know, utility costume yeah. with its different powers. And you could you could model that by having the singular invention have the alternate form perk, and so you could have four or five different alternate forms for your singular invention, um, in it representing different modes that he would switch between. Yeah. So that one that one would be, um, it's a complicated build, but it's not a complex build. If that makes sense, it doesn't require any special rules. You could do that right out of the book. Yeah. Oh. Uh... Next is Marcus Houch, aka Backdraft, who, as you can as you can clearly see, is he comes from a family of firefighters, and that was certainly an influence. Um, it was actually hard to get re to get references that didn't br that didn't bring up Fire Force. I want when it came to when it came to designing this, um, but fi originally he thought his ability was just being fireproof. But what it actually is, is that he is a something of an something of an energy lightning rod, where he he can store energy that he's hit with, and re, and redirect it, rechannel it. So in that regard, he's not too far removed from say Bishop. Got it. So in Ascendant, we call that power energy. We call that power energy absorption, mm -hmm. and it. Uh, when you take energy absorption, you pick um, what you can do with the energy that you absorb, and so you you know, and there's a number of options that you can pick from. Um, you know, you can fly with it, you can use it to attack back, you can create force fields, you can heal yourself, you can make yourself super strong, etc. And um, so it sounds like he's an energy absorber, and that would be a pretty straightforward build. Yeah. Is he? Does he have a shield there? Yes. Um, he ca he carries a shield that has a. That has a um, collapsible ladder within it. Okay, that's cool. Um, I'm get and I'm guessing the I'm guessing with energy absorber, it wouldn't be hard to also to also put it in where he can 
um, rechannel that energy. So if he get hit, if he got hit with lightning, he could fire. The, he could fire that lightning back. Uh, so there's two different ways you could handle that. Uh, so one, there's a reflection power where literally whatever you get hit with gets reflected back. Or what you can do with energy absorption is when you get hit by a particular type of damage, the next attack you make can deal that type of damage. Mm -hmm. The latter would probably be more apropos for him. Okay. So that, yeah, so absolutely. We, we actually have a character who's an energy absorber in um, my home game. He's called Equalizer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so if you if you uh, hit him with a flamethrower, he can return and shoot flame at you. You know, if you hit him, uh, if you punch him, he can punch you back really hard, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Um, I'd probably put in a flaw that this does not apply to kinetic energy. Oh, sure. That's cool. Yeah, actually, uh, Equalizer has the flaw that he can't um, absorb um, uh, damage from corrosive and toxic attacks. Mm -hmm. it's, he can only do energy and he can't do anything that's physical. Yeah. Um, next on the list is probably is probably the most arrogant of the group, and that is Oscar Venegas, aka Pacha Kamak, who his whole thing is be, is being able to being able to manipulate Earth, but he it is impossible for him to be subtle about it. Anytime he's using it, you're seeing it, you're seeing jagged rocks showing up. Ground, grounds, ground splitting, and all the, all the, all the big stuff that an Earth manipulator is going to do. Mm -hmm. He can't, he can't do a minor thing where he's just, where he's just throwing one rock or something. No, it's, it's a, it's a case where wherever he, whenever he gets in a fight, things are going to get damaged, which is why he has those mahahuitils, so that he, so that he can use, he can use his Earth powers. Without wrecking everything. Got it. So that would be an Earth controller. Mm -hmm. uh, the way Ascendant is written, whenever you use a power, you can always use it at a lower supermetric point than its maximum, as long as you reduce all of the capabilities. So for instance, if you have Blast 10, normally it does damage uh, 10 SPs and it has a range of 10 SPs. But you're perfectly welcome to say I'm going to dial my blast down to be six SPs of damage, but then it also also gets dialed down to six SPs of range, as mm -hmm. an example. So it sounds like with this character, he would have a power flaw that he can't dial down his SPs on his power be below a certain minimum. So he can do Earth Control 12, he can do Earth Control 11, he can do Earth Control 10, but he's not allowed to do Earth Control Five. You know, if he picks up someone who weighs, if he picks up a chunk of Earth that only weighs twenty pounds, and he throws it, he's going to throw it really fast. He can't throw it slower, etc. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that would work pretty well. And then the the um, the the two um, Aztec war clubs there are probably either devices or singular inventions, depending um, depending on whether they're kind of extensions of his powers or not. Um. The only part that would be extensions of his powers is the obsidian on them. Okay. So, yeah, I would probably treat those as devices. And so he would have, like, a, a striking power. Um, you know, and when he, doesn't have his, uh, when he doesn't have his clubs, he can't use his striking power. Mm-hmm. Because um, I presume the idea is that even though he's not super strong by using his earth control, he can wail on people really hard with his obsidian. Yeah, he's de he's definitely one. He would definitely be one of the harder hitters. It's just that he's not the he's not the kind of person you bring in for subtlety. He is an artillery strike. Yeah, which is which is why I said whenever he whenever he gets in fights, things get wrecked. But mm -hmm. um, next is Thorvald Eriksson, aka Thrudgelmir. Um. Okay. Now, on paper, hit on paper, his ab his ability is gi is gigantification. He can go up to about twenty five feet, but okay. in re in reality, that's not that's not the full scope of it. He's actually he's na he's naturally large. He's just shrinking mm -hmm. himself, and because of that, normally, um, his bo his body is extremely dense. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so. It sounds like he would be built as follows. He would be built with permanent growth, 
where you would decide what his real size is, and that would be a permanent effect. Mm -hmm. Then he would have linked shrinking and hyperdensity um, so that he can then reduce back down to a normal size, and as he reduces back down to normal size, um, he would get hyper-hyper-dense, which would make him uh, more formidable. Yeah, and the... I I had once joked that when it came to his density that um he does he doesn't need to wear armor when he when he's that small because um any any kind of bullet would just would just lightly sting him because it can't penetrate. Yep. Yeah, that that's a great build and um and ascendant would be really suited to building a character yeah. like that because you're taking you you're kind of exploiting, you know, physical criteria of, you know, density, volume, square cube law, etc. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a fun one for sure. Yeah, the the downside to being that dense is that he's very heavy, and yep. there's <laughs> it's outright stated that he can't that he can't go on flights because of that. Yep, that's right. So I'm, I'm not sh I'm not sure if that I'm not sure if that's enough to make it a power flaw, but it but it but it's certainly a bullet point that can be used. Well, no, it's actually built into the hyperdensity power, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't you wouldn't need to make it a power flaw because yeah. ascendant is physics based, so being hyperdense makes you weigh more necessarily. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't want to weigh more, you'd have to purchase that separately to avoid that. Yeah, the last one, and this is this one might be a bit tricky, is okay. Zaha Rademacher, aka Hard Case. All right, now. With this one, we were presented with a challenge of how do we... Because the random power setup gave us mimicry and constructs. And we had to figure okay. out how... We had to figure out how to how to mix it. Our solution was that she has power mimicry, but she can't utilize the power she mimics directly. She creates a humanoid construct that uses that effect. Each each one construct that she makes can use one effect, and she can only hope. Despite how many powers she might ha she might be able to mimic, she can only have two active at a time. Huh. Okay, that's definitely a complex character to build. Um, Ascendant has rules for having your own constructs. You could do them as singular inventions, and they would be um, autonomous robot objects. Or you could do them as minions or sidekicks, so that's no problem. Um, Ascendant also has a power replication where you can um, replicate other people's powers up to a certain power budget that's available to you um, with different ways of being able to acquire those powers. What would require some work would be figuring out how it is that the powers that she has um she can't use and the constructs use and you know it might well be like the way you do it is you build the constructs as the character and uh and she's the sidekick to the construct but you know the power is kind of vested in that but the construct you know loses has a has a vulnerable state where it loses its power replication if she's not nearby or she loses mm -hmm. her concentration or something yeah so that that one would require some work. That's kind of a that's kind of a janky build, but doable. Yeah, it's certain. Which would then again, this this was one that was that was difficult that was difficult to work with. And I I'd say of the ten, this is the only one where I may have where I may have to house rule a new a new setup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just go, just go with, just go with construct creation. Then give a special rule to said constructs. Right, right. Because, as far as the appearance of the constructs, they, they, they just look, they just look like humanoid outlines. Gotcha. So they're like force constructs, really. Pretty much. Force constructs that ha that have po that have powers equipped to them. Because uh, the the whole idea is her is her being a is her being this kind of one woman army strategist. Right, right, yep. Uh, now, with with that in with that in mind, that's it's definitely it's definitely a good spread of it. I 
I'm 50-50 about whether or not I'd have to house rule the Mahahuitils because of how because of how they work. How do they work? Um, they are they are definitely war clubs, but they're but they're war clubs that are sharp enough to t to take someone's head off, since uh -huh. since they're lined with obsidian. Yep. The tricky thing with obsidian is it's is um. As sharp as it can get, it's not exactly durable. Right. Oh, well, I mean, as an earth controller, though, wouldn't he be able to overcome that by just guaranteeing that the earth doesn't fracture when it's under his control? Um, the idea that I had is that he has to reload them. Ah, I see. Well, I mean, that's just... Uh, that's easy enough. I mean, that's just a limited use of power flaw and striking. So. Yeah, I'd not something the game couldn't handle mm -hmm. um, if that's if that's the direction you wanted to go with that build. No. Yeah, I mean, per personally, I would think if he's powerful enough that he can pick up and move Earth around in coherent bundles, um, that you know, I would think he'd be powerful enough to keep the structural integrity of a chip of obsidian intact. But you know, everybody's got their own views on comic book physics. So, well, the. The big reason that I'd keep that I'd keep that, I'd keep that, br that brittleness with um, Obsidian in his case is swinging too hard. Uh huh. Um, to to reference Spinal Tap, he go he goes to eleven and nothing else. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. And there's there's plenty of stories of some of someone of someone hitting something too too hard and breaking it. Mm -hmm. Uh there's there's an inf there's an infamous photo that I have of somebody at this axe throwing thing where he he managed to he managed to miss or he, he managed to not have the axe head hit the target but rather the handle hit and it's and it got embedded in the thing. Oh wow, it's pretty yeah, it's a good strong throw. So it's yeah. it's a case of you you missed and somehow still hit. Yep. Yep. And that's impressive. I, you know, I certainly don't have strength anywhere near that. If I threw an axe and the handle hit, it would just bounce off and fall on the floor, and I would look stupid. Also, I found the image. It's that. <laughs> and oh I, wow, that's awesome! Yeah, good. I saw good that. I was like, me. how the hell did you do that? Oh well, so it looks like what happened is there had, you know, because of the axe hitting so many times, the wood had a crack in it, and it looks like it sunk into the crack. You still need oh. you still need the dumbest of dumb luck to do that, for sure. Oh. For sure. But now I get how it happened. Yeah, but I I I've described I've described this as the ultimate version of fail forward. Spe yes. Yeah, that's a funny fail forward for sure. Speaking of that, I have noticed on the Arbiter of War of Worlds blog, which I of course I'm of course I subscribe to. That thank you, thank you've you. you've been on a bit of a kick regarding simulationism over the over the last week or so. I'm curious right. what brought that on. Oh well, I mean, I've been on a simulation kick for 20 years. I just hadn't talked about it. Um, what brought it on was a 4chan thread where my game Ascendant was being discussed, and. I was somewhat puzzled that there were two concurrent lines of criticism coming down about the game um, that were incoherent, and that is they couldn't both be true. And the first was that this is a game made by a literal, the quote was, this is a game designed by a literal autist, end quote, um, which simulates everything. And then the second criticism was that it's impossible to design a simulation based on superheroes because superheroes, you know, just can't really be simulated and you need to have a narrative game. And those two statements, either one of them could be true, but they both can't be true, right? Like, if it's actually a game that's autistically accurate, then it is, in fact, simulating what it needs to simulate. And, you know, if it's not, then it's certainly not as accurate as the first criticism would have. So, so I thought about why, and I realized that there's this major aversion to simulation that exists in a large percentage of the gaming community. 
And I traced back to why that was and when simulationism had gone out of style and why it was so heavily critiqued. And, um, and I kind of decided, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm probably one of the only guys in the industry right now who's designing tabletop simulations rather than, you know, story games or gamist games. And, you know, I should probably explain why. And so I wrote a manifesto. Mm -hmm. You know what I find ironic about that aversion to simulation or even, even the argument that was made in that 4chan thread? Mm. The fact that iRacing exists and the and the and the popularity of 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 sim, of simulation style driving obviously i racing is the big is the biggest case i mean that's used by actual pros yep but then you then you've got stuff like the simulationist leanings in gran turismo or i'd say one of the big examples is a set of course a competition uh huh or just or just a set of yeah, course Simulation is very respected within the video game community. You know, whether it's flight simulators, driving simulators, um, or some of the more complex and advanced, um, you know, military video games that have been created. Arma, I'm looking at you. Yeah, so very, you know, simulation very respected in the video game space. But when you come over into the tabletop space, people are aghast at the concept that you might possibly be able to simulate something. Or that you should even try, even though every single tabletop game today is the descendant of a simulation, so it's descendant of a simulation of medieval combat called Chainmail. And so, that and that um, is descended from the wargaming scene of the 70s, which a lot of them were designed around simulating historical battles. Exactly, exactly. So it turns out that um, the the uh, uh, upset against simulationism really stems from you know this this story games movement called the forge because they took the position that being a great game being a great simulation and being a great engine for storytelling are mutually incompatible and you can only do one of the three and then from there they made the they made the decision that um Simulation, but for simulation for its own sake, has no purpose, and so therefore it should just be discarded as a design goal. And so you're left with um, essentially, you know, games that are not really simulating anything; they're just games, and your or uh, story games that are trying to emulate narrative in a tabletop format. Um, and I, I just think they're flat wrong. Like there is no inherent contradiction. Uh, a good simulation can be a good game and it can be a good engine for storytelling. And um, not only would I say there's no con there's no conflict, I would actually say so there's synergy. The stories that you will be able to tell using a simulation are better than the stories you can tell than a game that's just run on GM fiat and make-believe. Um, and I think the the enjoyment of the gaming experience when you're playing a simulation is higher than enjoyment when you're playing a game that's totally disassociated from anything real. Um, now, different people have different levels of uh, interest in what I call noetic appreciation, which is to say the appreciation of the experience of something having verisimilitude. And I kind of co contrast it. It's like the opposite of willing suspension of disbelief, right? Like willing suspension of disbelief, you say, I'm willing to forget what I know in order to enjoy this entertainment product. Right? That's suspension of disbelief. Noetic uh, appreciation says, I'm going to use what I know to better enjoy this entertainment product. So for instance, noetic appreciation is watching the movie Alexander by Oliver Stone and admiring the fact that Oliver Stone got all of the battle tactics, costumes, and characters correct. It's the best presentation of Macedonian warfare that's ever been made. And if you are a fan of Macedonian warfare and you've read the accounts of the battles, it's amazing. You're seeing the actual battles unfold on the screen. And that's a noetic appreciation. Um, and that's very different from appreciating the movie because of the great acting or appreciating the movie because of the riveting story. You're literally appreciating it because of its verisimilitude. Yeah. Um, and so I think the failure to the 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 forge failed to understand that and so their theory led our industry astray. I'd say 
if I'm, I have, I have, I've had a mixed relationship with, um, simulationism. Okay. Um, I will admit a good, a good chunk of it is I ended up getting a very bad first impression because of a, because of certain crowds that use simulationism as a cudgel. What I mean, which what, crowd, what what game or system are you referencing? I'm not referencing one in particular. This was just, this was just a pattern that I would notice, where they where they um they would spend they would spend way too much time looking at looking at works of fiction and excessively breaking down everything that was not his not um historically accurate enough, even mm -hmm. even in instances where. Do, we're doing that. We're doing that would be um, pointless, right? And, right. So that's so that's interesting because that's not noetic appreciation. What that is is that's what I would call noetic critique. So you're um, you're enjoying a product less because of what you know, and some people are just very sensitive to that, and you know. Um, like, you know, if I try and watch a horse movie with my wife, who's an equestrian, you know, it, it's not going to last two minutes into the movie before she's going to be critiquing the way the actress has obviously never ridden a horse before. Look at her terrible leg posture. And I'm like, OK, well, you know, I, I just just kind of a really beautiful black stallion on a beach. But, you know, like the experienced equestrian experiences the movie very differently and than I do. I, I um, can certainly I can certainly understand that. Oh. Um. I think I think where I draw the I think where I draw the line is when when it's when it's um when it gets when it gets performative. Um, yeah, absolutely, of course, and like, and that's true of everything in our world today. I um when we're when my co-host Zan and I were talking about Convictor Drive, we noticed that one of the um characters equip, which is a Convictor Drive, is a interesting beast. I'll get uh, that I that it would be t tricky to go into the skinny for, but. Um, one of the character archetypes mentioning that it had that it had that it dual wielded um, fi fifty cal handguns, and we in some people would complain about complain about what kind of fifty cal are you talking about? We just ended up making um, jokes about it, like 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 say, like saying um, what what if it's what if it's fifty bmg? What if it's fifty bmg? And he, and he was like, that's a horrifying thought. Of a of a handgun chambered in fifty bmg, which there is a right. there is a pistol that's fifty that's fifty bmg, but um, it itself is terrifying, especially since right. it has a chainsaw handle on the thing. Um, but in our in our case, it's use it's using what we know what we know regarding different types of fifty cal and and just and just having fun and just having fun with it. Right. Right. Um, but when, but I mean, but I think, I think when it comes to that sort of thing with say film, I'm able to get the bigger picture because it'd be hard. It'd be hard to find an actor who is both good at acting and good at riding a horse. And every actor mm -hmm. that I've ever met has had a "I can do that" story. Yep. yep. Even though they can't. <laughs> yep. So, it's one of the, it's one of those things, right? I understand I understand it, but depending on how, depending on how much of a stir someone makes about it, I may end up having to step in and say, recognize the bigger picture, people. <laughs> oh, again, I know I know that suppressors aren't little zip noises that 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 people think when they see them in films, mm -hmm. but. I also know the practicality of ha of of firing blank, even firing suppressed blanks, in cer in certain scenes is going to have noise problems unless you want to give everybody ear pro. Mm-hmm. But it's it's and and wait and waste way too many squibs. So it's a ca it's a case of I get it. But I get, but I get the, I get the realities of making a film, at the same time. Um. Well, you know, I agree with you. Certainly, there are there are folks that um, they refuse to make a good faith suspension of disbelief 
and prevent themselves from enjoying a particular movie. No doubt. Yeah. Um, however, I think a much bigger problem, and this is why I'm such an avowed simulationist, I think a much bigger problem is that screenwriters and movie makers and novelists today are taught to not even give a shit about verisimilitude. Um, oh, yes. I took, I took a screenwriting master class, and one of, the, uh, one of the things they told us was that at any moment, your character should do whatever is most dramatic. Not what your character would really do, but whatever is most dramatic. And you see it. You, you see that attitude when you watch TV shows, and the people do things that make absolutely no sense in the context of human behavior and human psychology for the sort of person they are, but they do it because it's more dramatic. Like, I'm not going to tell my best friend this important secret that would change his life. Why? Well, because if I did, it would spoil episode seven, so I'm just not going to do it. And... Um, and I find it really painful to watch shows like that. It breaks me out of my immersion. Um, and I really want to see shows that are built with loving attention to the detail of the world. You know, the Peter Jackson, Middle Earth type. Uh, are type are you familiar with the Harv Bennett story regarding Star Trek II? No. Um, this, this is one of those things I use when it comes to illustrating pay, paying, that, paying that amount of attention. Um, Harv Bennett was the producer for The Wrath of Khan. And okay. before that, he had not seen a single episode of Star Trek. Okay. In preparation, he watched the entire original series and took notes the whole time. Ah, uh, yeah. Grant, yep. Granted, some, and got and got in, tr got in trouble with some folks because of some of the things he wanted to do. Like, um... Plenty of folks had had said that you that you can't kill Spock, and he's like, "Sure you can. It's just a matter of how you do it. If you do it right, right. the audience won't even question it." Right. Uh, right. But when it and truth truth be told, um, I've ne I was never a big fan of the Forge because I I felt uh -huh. I felt that they overcompensated. Mm hmm. Though I will admit, there was a glut of RPGs in the 90s that went about their attempt at simulation the wrong way. I think that's correct, that um, there were some games that had made bad design choices. I think there was also um, a lack of appreciation of the diminishing returns of simulation. So, you know, there's the old saying, you know, the map is not the territory. And, and I wrote about this in Arbiter of Worlds. Um, you know, a map becomes not useful if the map is the size of the real world, but no map smaller than the real world can actually be a 100% accurate map, right? So the goal shouldn't be to try and simulate everything. It should be to simulate the things that are going to be important for the experience of that particular product. Mm -hmm. um, and you should recognize that there are, you know, there are diminishing returns on it because humans have limited brain power and we have limited attention spans and limited working memory. And people vary on those and some people are better and some people are not as good in those areas and different games can appeal to different folks. But, you know, as a designer, I always say, like, look, there's limited returns on these things. And my community is constantly pushing me to add more complexity to all of my games because they really love that. But if I went with all of that complexity, the um, you know the game would would die um, from being too complex. So sometimes you have to say no. You know, uh, I'll give you an example. Just happened today was um, you know there's rules and acts for um, uh, you know putting arrow loops and door frames and things like that on your castle, right? And they wanted to know like could I add rules to give a price discount? if you construct it in the first place with those planned in versus adding them later. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, you know, I'm not going to do that. That's an unnecessary step of complexity for a very minor in-game benefit of a few pieces of gold. And then, you know, the player gets really stressed out about having to build, you know, I, oh, I need to save money by making sure I've planned where all my windows go in advance. And just, no, it's the, that, that's, not, that's not improving the game. It's Certainly it's a more detailed simulation, but it's not improving the game. So that's um, an example of what I... 
yeah, I'm not, I will admit one of my whipping boys regarding this has always been um, Phoenix Command, and as well as every game that Fantasy Games Unlimited put out. Yeah, now you know Fantasy Games Unlimited had a they had a very simulationist approach, and they had a particular audience that liked those games, then bought those games. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's fine. Um, I think if you go as far down the road as Fantasy Games Unlimited did, you you know you also kind of ex expect and accept that you're not going to be as popular as White Wolf or Wizards of the Coast because you're, you know, targeting a more niche audience. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean it's a bad game. I own a bunch of fantasy game unlimited games, but I don't ever play them. They, you know, they're they're too far on that spectrum for me. Yeah. But, now with, with all that said, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for, um, ro for Rogue's Gallery? Oh gosh! Well, Rogue's Gallery is done. It's written, so um, it's just a matter of laying it out and releasing it to the audiences, mm -hmm. uh, and then there'll be the printing. You know, the printing and shipping takes a long time. That's like a six or seven month process. But the, um, you know, but uh, just all right. And I will certainly be looking forward to it. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. And of course. Thank you for having me. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Well, thanks, to, thanks for having me back on the show. I really appreciate it. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!